Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm gonna to show you something a little bit different. I'm gonna show you uh, my Silverado. Kinda of go over some of the things I did to it. There's not a lot of information when I was building the truck about eight months ago that was very helpful. So I figured I'll go through and kind of show you what I did to fit certain things and some of the processes I took to get there. So hope you enjoy, here we go. All right, so it's a 2020 Silverado 1500 RST 4x4 crew cab. So it's got the white bumpers, LED lights, black mirrors, painted door handles. So I really like the truck. It is lifted about three inches in the front, no lift in the rear on 35 inch tires. They're uh, 35 by 12 and a half. R17, so they actually are a true 35. They're on a 17 by eight and a half method uh, with a, I think they're a zero offset. So they're pretty, they're not too aggressive. I didn't want them to stick out super far. I kind of want to pull under the truck as much as possible and still give me clearance from rubbing. The 17s do give you a little bit of an issue. You have to make sure they do want to rub the caliper if you have the wheel weights in the middle of the barrel. So if, if they put a wheel weight in the middle of the barrel and it's a one ounce, it will hit the calipers. So I had to take them back and have them road force balanced again. And they put them on the outer edge of the barrel and then on the inner right behind the spokes. And then it worked out perfect. It cleared. There's a lot of weights on that one. But anyway, so the one ounces do hit. Also, we'll go over the fitment in the front. You do have to do some fender liner modifications to fit the 35s. It's not that big of a deal. A lot of people all over the forums are like, well, how do you fit them, how do you fit them, what do you do, what do you do? And they want like a for sure answer that they're not gonna have to tear their truck up, especially with these new trucks. So I couldn't find too much. I found a little bit here and there, but I'm gonna go through a little bit better. I wish I would have filmed this when I did it, because it'd be a lot more of a how-to, but I can go through it good enough, I think, to give you an idea to steer you in the right direction. So the first thing is, I'll talk about the Kings real quick. When I got them, King doesn't really tell you like a setup. They just tell you, they recommend you go up a half inch, half inch up, half inch down type deal um, for the preload, but they don't really tell you what like they're set at from the factory for lift-wise. So I will tell you this, it's like right about three inches worth of lift. And that's about the max I would say until you start having uh, CV issues. So I figured that out the hard way. When I got them, I cranked them up another inch of threads almost and started having binding issues. So then I had to take it back apart again. It was just a nightmare. So I had to get alignment again. So just know that leave them alone, throw them on the truck. You'll get your three inches lift. I also did the super lift front upper control arms because I wanted to have uh, like a factory style ball joint in the front and not a uniball and then the rubber inside bushings and then they're tubular. They use a Moog problem solver front ball joint which I've always had luck with even on my race cars and stuff. So that was nice. It gives you the deeper cup so it helps correct the suspension geometry. I wish I would've went uniball now after talking to some other people who daily drive these trucks with uniballs on them as the upper ball joint. It's just a, like a spherical, it's called a uniball. They say it, it tightens up the steering a lot, which I don't really have a complaint about the steering on this, but with big tires, it's always good to have everything as tight as possible with the steering. So I might upgrade to those in the future. We'll see how this ball joint lasts long run. Seems to be doing pretty good now. I don't have any issues. So let's get back to the fender liner. Let me get the light real quick. Let's start with the front. So if you can see, let's try to get this light a little better for you guys. All right. There's two holes, one right there and one right there. Now we'll show the light up how you can see. Those holes, there was a bracket behind there. It's like a plastic bracket. I took that bracket off just because the tire would rub barely at full lock. So now this moves, doesn't make any wind noise surprisingly. I was going to like kind of use a zip tie probably and zip tie it to this bottom hole right here. 
but I didn't want to start zip tying everything, and it doesn't make any wind noise surprisingly. I don't know how, but it does. So I took the two factory screws and I found a brace behind here and I located on the fender liner, just cut an X in the, the carpet fender liner, drilled a pilot hole, like an eighth inch pilot hole, because these are like self tappers. So I was gonna use like a nut insert tool and put a nice insert, threaded insert in the frame. And I was like, I'm trying to overcomplicate this. Just, I wanna use the factory hardware so it looks factory. So I just drilled a pilot hole and then zipped these right in and they hold fine. They look, looks kind of factory. So what it did was it pulled this back like a half of an inch real tight against the frame here, which in turn pulled the bottom almost like an inch. So it clears the tire now at full lock and everything's good up there. So now we'll go to the back, which is a little more complicated, not much stuff. Just a bracket and some screws. So, okay, let's start with this. The tire usually hits from like here to here wet at full lock. That was where the issue was. And it barely hit, but I don't want to drive around here and my tires rub and it just, not fun for you buy an expensive truck and you spend a lot of money on it and just to hear it rub is kind of ridiculous so these are the factory screws took them out over from over here relocated them and there's a I'll show you from underneath there's a frame rail behind here just cut an X in the carpet again and there was a gap here so when you look from behind I noticed there was a gap so what I did was I drilled pilot holes, screwed it in, zipped those in, and it held the, the carpet back. So now it's real tight against that frame brace. The next thing was that I read on the forums was that you have to cut the mud flaps. So the mud flap was barely rubbing, and it was like something like I was like, it would wear away, but I just, like I said, didn't want to catch it, rip the mud flap off, cause paint damage or any of that, so I did end up cutting it. In the future, I'm actually gonna make uh, like more of like a rally style uh, mud flap because the side of my paint is getting destroyed from these tires. And plus I have a gravel driveway, so it's not very fun. But anyway, I cut this in half. So it used to come to about here, I cut it in half, clears perfect. You want a reference point, we'll get under here. You can kind of see, I just cut it straight with the pinch weld because I knew that would be like kind of a nice reference point, make everything look clean. If you look right here, that bracket that I was talking about, it's a big steel bracket that sat behind the fender liner. So you have to take that off. It's behind the fender liner and behind the mud flap. It kind of holds both. There's one of the bolts and then the two upper bolts are a little higher. You can't miss them when you pull the fender liner off. It's a big black, it's probably the size of your hand, a little bigger. Um, steel bracket, gloss black. So you just pull that out, throw it away. You don't use it anymore. Then this, you can see here's the frame rail. And then this is a support that goes to the body mount. This is what the fender liner now bolts to. So as you can see that, I'll get the light in there better. So that's what you're actually bolting to if you want a reference of it. And then we'll talk more about. So that bracket sat behind here and it pushed this out quite a bit. So that's why you had to get rid of it. It wouldn't allow the fender liner to pull in over here with that bracket in there. I tried a couple times because I didn't want to pull it off, but like I said, you can't notice it's not there. Fender liner doesn't move. This holds the fender liner, it screws to hold it back and it screws into the fender. And then there's those two bolts there. And then in the side of the fender, there's a clip that pushes in this way from the side. So when you take this off, you gotta pull it out. A lot of people say, well, I just delete the, the mud flap. Well, I wanted the mud flap to try to block as many rocks as I could and to keep the truck a little cleaner. But the, also the other reason is you have a hole here. So I've seen a couple of options if you did want to get rid of this. The first option is people, like 10 years ago, I remember seeing it on car, on GM cars. I don't know if they still offer it. There's a little, Chrome GM emblem, it's like a one inch by one inch square, maybe a little smaller. I've seen people take those, buy those because they still sell them, and they're like double side tape, they put it over there, 
and it covers the hole and then you just have like a little GM logo. I just don't like because it, it sits real close to the edge of the fender. So it kind of looks awkward. The other thing that I've seen a company, a four x four company just actually started making these. Um, it cuts off pretty much right here. So it looks nice and flat like this and it contours underneath the fender all the way to the bottom of the fender, kind of like a trim piece. And there's no mud flap anymore. So they make that, I'm trying to think of what the company name is. If anybody knows it, go ahead and post it up in the comments or I'll try to find it and put it in the description. But that's, uh, that's how you do that. It's pretty self-explanatory there. The rear has no lift. It's about three quarters of an inch to an inch, I haven't measured it lately, an inch lower in the back. I wanted that pre-runner style look, so you don't really have to do anything block-wise. There's no blocks in the back of these trucks anyway. It's spring on axle. You can, if you wanted the level look, if you wanted to lift the back a little bit. I know a 14 and 15, 2014, 2015, Silverado 1500 uses like a, a one inch or it's like barely an inch and a quarter rear block. So you can put that under there and it would sit pretty level. Um, I know all the other aftermarket companies seem to be like two inch blocks that are a little too big that you'd have to start jacking the front up, front end up again. And then you gotta worry about CV angles and stuff like that. So. I think the factory block is your best option if you wanted to lift the back up and then uh, throw your your uh, shocks on there too. So that's it with the lift. If anybody has any questions or has anything to add, just go ahead and shoot a comment in the on the video or message me because uh, I just want to try to help get the info out there because I know there's a lot of guys with these trucks, they're starting to get a little bit, this body style is starting to get a little older now. So there's going to be more guys lifting them and there just isn't the, the support out there for it. And it's still an expensive truck. I mean, nobody wants to just guess. I mean, I, I screwed up a couple times. I bought, um, I didn't buy the Kings at first. I bought a super lift kit for the front and a three inch and I, uh, broke the top hat. You have to hammer the studs out of the top hat of the um, for the shock, and I cracked it. It's aluminum, and I called GM, and I had the truck for like two weeks, and they said, "Oh, that part's not available. It's we don't know when we're gonna get it." So I freaked out. I was like, "Well, I don't have a daily driver right now, and my truck's on uh, stand." So I had to call King. It was either King or Icon, and order some coilovers. So I ended up going with the Kings just because King has been a brand in off-road around forever. And it was kind of a good upgrade, kind of a good thing to happen. Uh, my wife asked me if I did it on purpose. I didn't, <laughs> but we'll go over a little more now. Like I said, if there's any questions or anything on the lift, feel free to hit me up here or on Instagram. I post a lot of pictures of this truck at the JDM Don. This is the next big upgrade I did that I really, really like. I wish I could drive with them more. They're Baja Design Squadron Sports. They're the spotlight version, so all the lights have a clear lens and they're not, um, I can actually show you Felicia's Forerunner. She has the ones that they're spotlights and then the bottoms are for like a wide angle, so they have like lines to break them up. But anyway, we'll get into that. Everybody says, well, you can get, they're quite expensive. They say you can get cheaper online, this and that. And the quality of these, I'm telling you, is worth it. It's worth the extra money. Save up if you have to. It's just, it's a no brainer. The fit and finish is amazing. Their customer service is great. I messed up a little. I The bracket fits in between the hood hinge and the hood. I could not, it like, so you could tell it's really tight in there. I could not get this thing to fit in there properly. So I ended up calling them after 20 minutes, 30 minutes, frustrated, making sure I had the right brackets. They confirmed I did right away. And then they said, hey, email us pictures. We'll try and help you out. Luckily, I spent a couple more minutes after I got off the phone with them before I took pictures and emailed them and I got it to fit. You just kind of got to finagle it in there a little bit. And it is a, 
it it only fits one way the way it has to get fit over the um the the bolts to go in so anyway that's the install for those um they fit really nice they open with the hood the light output is amazing those paired with i would highly recommend like i said if you get a a chevy get the led lights that's worth every penny the led fogs are great the led headlights are amazing i've had a couple different generations of these chevys and by far they have upped their lighting Ugh, leaps and bounds the fogs i'm probably going to do the baja designs kit that fits in the factory spot and looks clean just because i really like their products and the factory works good so i might not do it right away but i just love the look of their stuff the billet look the rugged look is just there and the quality is is superb so and they're a good company so i like to support good companies so we'll go over a little bit i had an issue when i wanted to wire in those lights the let me grab a light real quick so i can show you guys the most people just throw a, a switch drill a hole and throw a switch they gave me a switch with the kit and it was pretty nice it just the truck's expensive and i wanted it to be different i didn't want it to be just thrown together um especially I do get rid of my stuff quite often, so I thought for the next owner, I didn't want a hodgepodge thing for something this expensive, because most when you trade them in, they don't care what you did to them anyway. But I found out that a factory option GM offered was called the Upfitters option. It's Upfitters package. It's a switch package. The only issue was GM like stopped selling the kit. I don't know if they had issues with people installing it and they didn't want to deal with it, or what it was, but there is a good form, Chevy, I think it's Chevy trucks, their form. If you just search, Google search Chevy 1500 Upfitters package, it'll come up one of the on the front page. A bunch of guys on there did a really good job at um, figuring out the part numbers you need, how to basic install, kind of like that there's just not a there's not a video so i kind of want to show a video of and not the install unfortunately i should have done that but just kind of how the layout is it makes it a lot easier it it did take me a minute and i know there's a lot of people that i, I really like wiring there's a lot of people that don't like it that are like i don't want to deal with that and especially with gm they don't seem to want to offer any help with this like i said if you ordered this from the factory a lot of guys were saying they installed the kick panel with the switches in it and then bolted the fuse block to the inside of the kick panel and then threw the wiring in the back seat on a factory truck when it when it got delivered and you ordered it with that option and you paid buku bucks i think it was like three times the cost for the option that it cost me to buy the parts so then guys were having to argue with the dealers saying hey are you going to install this like what's going on and the dealers were confused and a lot of them just ended up installing them or working out deals with the owners which was cool uh shout out to all the dealers that did that because i mean you shouldn't buy a forty fifty thousand dollar truck and and have the wiring harness thrown in the back especially when it was like a seven hundred dollar plus option so let's go over that a bit right now i'll stop talking so much here's the the switch kit so you can see there it's real nice and clean when you turn the lights on, it lights up. The buttons light up when they're actually activated, which is super nice. As you can see, the. Oh, I'm just gonna turn on my lights, but you can't tell that. Um, but anyway, it looks real nice. Oh, let me turn those lights off so it stops beeping. So there are five parts for this kit. The first part is the kick panel. The kick panel either comes in black or gray, so it, it has this hole cut out. That's the only difference. And I was gonna try to cut it out myself, but I wouldn't recommend that. For the price of the panel, it was under 100 bucks. The way this clips in, I don't think I could've cut it nice enough. Um, and it has like a reinforcement where this pushes in. It's just super nice uh, to not have to worry. So then my truck has the push button start and then no center console. So I think like the other optional ones, I think there's like four panels. Some of them have the center console, some of them have keyed start, and the black and the brown difference. So, but okay, so one part is that. 
The next part is the switches themselves with the little harness that comes off of them. The next part is the actual relay fuse box, which is right here. It's real nice. It mounts, it bolts behind here. There's a little bracket. It's got a nice breakdown of what's inside it. Clips in real nice. So then from there, there's a harness that goes up to, it's hard to see, it's way up in there, but um, the factory, let me switch this around so I can look at this. The factory truck has to have, from what I've read and what I've understood, the only option you have to have is for like a trailer package. So you have to have the hitch and the wiring, which I think I've never seen one without that. Now I know the new trucks, I didn't find this out till after I bought my truck. The new 1500s, they, it's an option. So you can have the trailer package, which is the tow package, but it's an option to get the trailer brake controller on top of that. So my truck did not have that, so I had to put an aftermarket trailer brake controller. But anyway, so usually on these trucks up in the dash, there's by the brake pedal straight up, can't miss it. There's a plug that doesn't have anything going to it. You plug it into there, that's for the trailer brake controller. Um, plug that in there and then the leads come off and then they plug directly in that fuse block. Uh, so then that's what ties the fuse block to the factory engine harness or the factory control harness which activates the lights, turns it on when you turn the truck off, turns it off when you turn the truck off, blah, blah, blah. So that has so if you're worried about, well, I need to hook up a trailer brake controller, I was worried about that once I realized it plugged into that plug. What's cool is with the, the harness that goes to the fuse block, they have three running leads that you can wire in yourself to the trailer brake controller. So all I did was use a Weatherpack GM plug and plug those wires in. And one of the wires is for like main power, the other is for ignition on power, and then the third one is brake signal wire. So when you have the brake depressed, it sends a signal to the controller. So, and then the fourth wire for the brake controller is the ground, which I just did a little eyelet and grounded it to the chassis right under there. There was a, a couple grounds, just bolted it right in. You can find any piece of metal underneath the dash cage to bolt it to, real nice and easy. And so that's the, the other piece, that's the fourth piece is the harness. So you have so far, go over it real quick before I move on. The kick panel, one, two, the switches, three, the fuse and relay box itself, four is the harness that goes to the truck, then five, I'll show you up here, is last but not least, the main important part. With one hand. is the power wire. So it's like a, it's like a four, four gauge wire, maybe six. So anyway, the as the, the diagram showed, which wasn't very good, there's the harness goes into the cab right there. Then there was this little nipple that came off of it that was sealed up. Cut the end off that, shove the wire through it, comes out right behind the brake pull it through, and then you connect it to a post on the fuse block, you can't miss it. So then it comes up, it's already pre-wrapped, you secure it to the, the holes that hold the cowl on. Actually broke one of the clips, so it's just chilling right there. Until I get a new one, which I just forgot about till now. And then it goes in the factory power distribution block, which is right here. So it comes in, comes into here. And so this is where the battery, which is right here, wow, right in front of my face, gives all power to the whole truck. So then it comes up, that's what this plate's for. It gives you these little studs that you slide in. So all this is blank. This is this plastic is just empty. So they give you these studs, you slide these studs in, you put the posts on with the fuses, then you put this plate on top to connect them all and then the 60 amp goes to power the whole relay panel and then this 200 amp is a 
one they give you, and I'm assuming it's for like plows and stuff like that. So a lot of the 2500 guys would probably like that, and they could run the power directly uh, to their plow, which would be really nice. So then it's nice and clean power to it instead of running something off the battery cable. So that's it. Um, show you what else. Oh, we were talking about trailer brake controllers. I'll tell you this, I used this one once so far. Worked out pretty good, so I might share it. Looks pretty factory in this spot. So it's a, it's right there. It's a Kurt Spectrum, and it's a, it's got an accelerometer underneath the dash that you mount, so it can read. It's like a progressive brake controller, and it, it's you just set how aggressive you want it, and then it'll automatically sense what kind of grade you're on, and kind of go from there. So that's that. And then I also did the, uh, when I had the dash apart, I did the little uh, mod to delete the auto st stop. It uses uh, like a, a capacitor to trick. It remembers what you had it set at. So it just plugs in in between the, the harness. So if you, if you want to use it on, you can turn it on, but you don't have to turn it off every time you get in the truck, which is nice. It remembers where it was at. And then the last thing I did was I did the rough country tire calibrator with the inline one that plugs in under the dash right here. Pretty self-explanatory. You program it, plug it in. They show you which wire to plug in. It's a pretty good system. I did have an issue with the first one I got, but they um, sent me a new unit and it works great now. But that's it. That's the truck. Pretty happy with it. I would recommend if somebody's looking at worried about putting 35s on a, a newer truck and daily driving it. It works great. I get 19, 20 miles per gallon. I drive a decent amount of highway, um, but it's got the eight speed transmission with the 5.3. So it does pretty good. I, I think it's not bad for a daily. I drive 25,000 miles a year with this thing. So, I mean, I, I don't mind it, but all right. Well, thanks for watching. Till next time.